You talked to voters, which we've been doing nonstop. Listen, I called as soon as the Trump endorsement happened. Right. I called voters, and every single one of them was scratching their head. They didn't understand why Oz was running. They didn't understand why he was running in Pennsylvania. He was. Would you have gotten the same reaction had he endorsed um, McCormick? No. Interesting. No, I don't think so. They they know him as a celebrity doctor yeah. who talks about products on, on television. Um, they do not know him as a politician, as somebody who understands the issues. And they they don't see the Trump alignment there other than the celebrity. And when we watched the first debate, every single time he brought up the Trump endorsement, people groaned. The groans grew louder each time he brought it wow. up. And b the voters that we watched that debate with came out saying, these two front runners were seeing their names everywhere, yeah. but they're these mega rich guys. I, I don't really understand how they can connect with me and represent me. So they came out of this a little bit disillusioned. Andy, I think uh, I, if I, one thing I did hear McCormick say a lot was how how many ties he has to the state of Pennsylvania. Seventh generation Pennsylvania, he said at one point. Obviously, he thinks he, A, has to continue to establish that, but is that the way to sort of keep knocking Oz? I think it is because I've covered several McCormick events over the last several weeks, and that is a common theme. Yeah. My family, I own a farm in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, right, right in central Pennsylvania. He's the native homegrown guy. I'm not the guy who parachuted in from New Jersey. He name-checked all the places he played high school sports. Right. right. You know, he's now, been very careful with that. And yeah. Todd, when you're talking about in, in, in anywhere in Pennsylvania, especially in northeastern Pennsylvania, Shikalami, Shikshini, yeah. Bloomsburg, Catawissa, small towns, they're the folks who are the, the Trump supporters. They'll be driving through the highway then you'll see the Trump flags, uh, you know, bring America back, that kind of thing. So, yeah, he's hitting uh, keynotes. Do you think Oz and McCormick have have either one of them actually tapped in to the MAGA base? I mean, is it is it turn out that those folks are sniffing them both out here? I don't think they have. Again, anecdotally, I don't yeah. think they have because they're so close. And then you see Kathy Barnett and we were talking, you know, people I've spoken to on the street said that she is re resonating her message with folks. Is she the real conservative uh, Republican in this race in Pennsylvania? But you mentioned before you were talking about the celebrity of, of Dr. Oz. I think people do get a good vibe, many get a vibe from Oz because he's like a Trump type uh, right. personality. No, Trump wasn't a lawmaker. He was involved, he, he was a celebrity. So they're trying to think is this the same kind of, of uh, blueprint? Uh, to success. Dasha, you've been talking to a bunch of voters. Yeah. What have you learned? I, I don't think that's necessarily sticking, though. Look, when you look at the polls, Oz, 18%, McCormick, 16%. That's not a whole lot of the vote. No, 40%. These are a big undecided, yeah. 40% are undecided, Chuck. That is a massive number of people. One week out, one week out, 40 are undecided. We went door knocking yeah. with two uh, ladies. They call themselves Trump gals. They are huge Trump fans. And they've been door knocking for three weeks for Carla Sands another underdog in this race. They love Trump. They don't get the Oz thing. They think he made a mistake. They've knocked on doors in Westmoreland County, deep, deep red. They said they have not yet met a single Oz supporter. And they were themselves surprised by that. And when we went door knocking with them for, you know, a, a couple of hours, every single door that opened was an undecided voter. Very interesting. You know, one thing uh, that um, I think some of us overlooked in 16 and none of us overlooked it in 20 is, Andy, and I'm sure you... Trump's political organization is quite strong in Pennsylvania. They did a bunch of voter re-registrations between 16 and 20. Are you seeing evidence that he's able to flip that switch for Oz yet? I think he can. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we're only a week away from the May 17th primary, and it seems you know in the political world that's like like a, a blink of an eye. However, because the race is so close, if you have all these undecided, at least what I'm hearing on the street, undecided. Even they're, they're, those supporting Oz are not attack or McCormick are not attacking Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. They're saying we don't we respect him. We don't respect his decision. Do I think he can flip the switch? Absolutely. Uh, we were talking before air back in 2016 when right. Donald Trump took the ride down the escalator. Right. Okay. And I could tell you what I heard in northeastern Pennsylvania. There was a long a lot of people saying they may be laughing at him right now. Yeah. But he resonates his message. He's speaking what we're talking about at the dinner table. I'm gonna about to bring in Lisa here. I want to get some of her impressions from the other side of the state. But Andy. I, I got to ask you this just in case I don't get another chance. Oz Fetterman in northeastern Pennsylvania, who would, it, it, you know, <laughs> or, or who would play better here? That's like Rocky Balboa. Yeah. Uh, the sequel, first, second and third fight. Who would fare better? Again, anecdotally, I think right now at this point in time, again, a week before. Yeah. I think Fetterman. Fetterman can overperform Fetterman. A, an average Democrat yes. right now. Right. If it's Oz, is it easier against Oz or McCormick? 
easier against Oz, I believe, because he's from Braddock, Pennsylvania. Yeah. He's a local guy. He speaks the language yeah. of the Democrats, but uh, but also a little bit of conservatism in there also. So he, he's not your traditional Democrat candidate. All right. This is the story from the east part of the state. Let's go to the other side of the state uh, where I have my colleague, Lisa Sylvester. Lisa, you've moderated both debates, so you get an idea, uh, obviously, of, of what's resonating. Who's resonating the best in this Republican primary out there? I, I think of Beaver County. I know that's Trump country. Who's playing best in Beaver County? Well, it really comes down to celebrity versus sincerity. So Oz obviously has the celebrity factor. He's got the wow. People know him. They know his name uh, from the years of being on television. But I got to tell you, coming out of the debate, the one person that a lot of people were saying, hey, let me take another look at was actually Kathy Barnett. And you have actually seen her numbers rise mm -hmm. since the debate. And the reason why I think is because she comes across as more sincere. So if you are looking for the America First candidate, a lot of people are taking another look at her because she doesn't just sort of speak the talking points. You really get the sense that she lives them, that she has a history, that she has believed and has held these beliefs for, for a while. With McCormick and Oz, it's a little bit of a head scratcher because you're like, well, maybe this is what they really believe, but maybe it's not, especially when you see the attack ads. And the other thing too is, Kathy Barnett, if you look at just the amount of money spent in this race, she has spent nowhere near yeah. the amount of money that McCormick and Oz has spent, yet she is resonating. And I think it's because she's doing very much a grassroots, 1,500 miles traveling mm -hmm. across the state, and people see her as sincere and they see her as authentic. Lisa, uh, I know we have a big satellite delay. really appreciate you giving us a few minutes there. Dasha, let me bring it back to you. What she just described of Kathy Barnett is what I hear people describe of John Fetterman, too. Right? It is sort of the, hey, they're not traditional, but they're speak. I mean, it's this... Uh, you know, there's a new paradigm. And it's the language that was used about Trump. Yeah. I'm hearing voters say the exact same things, not the typical politician about Fetterman and about Kathy. She has an unconventional story and she really has been doing that grassroots work. She has been all over Pennsylvania. And in many ways, her talking points, when you actually listen to her, match up very closely with what a lot of the Trump base want to hear. And like I said, it, some people are impressed that someone with a lot less money, with a right. lot a lot less name recognition. People like an underdog. Trump was outspent left and right in 16. People forget this. Yeah. On every level, he was outspent. So if you do catch enough traction in a primary, you don't need to be the biggest spender, right, Andy? Right, and I can tell you, back going back to 2016, who would have thought in northeastern Pennsylvania, a rich guy from New York with a lot of money who'd never been involved in politics as far as running for office, can win in Luzerne County and flip this county, which, as yeah. we all know, is a bellwether state in the whole country. And we're doing shows here. Why? Because we saw in 2016, can it happen again? Can he flip it to Oz this time around? Yeah. I think he can. So it's not out of the realm of possibility, but as Dasha was talking before, there's a different dynamic. Now, I think people also, anecdotally, they don't want your typical politician. We've seen that, been there, done that. Mm -hmm. What's coming down that someone who really could, uh, knows what we're feeling? Well, that's why I think McCormick isn't necessarily running away with it, because if, if the Republican Party could chisel a no, perfect candidate, right? No, he looks like a perfect right? 2012 candidate. Yeah. And I say this with no disrespect. He looks exactly like Mitt Romney's Republican Party, and that would have been a winner. At the same time, the question I have is for those 40 percent of undecided voters, at the end of the day, Will they say, listen, I, I, there's there's not enough time to do all this research. Right. Trump says this guy's it. You know, I talked to to one gentleman who owns a bar, um, Dave McGill. They call him Mogi. He owns Mo Mogi's Irish pub in the western part of the state. He told me he flipped from Democrat to Republican to vote for Trump. He still considers himself a Democrat, but he voted for Trump. He wants a Republican victory because uh, the economy, he blames Biden for inflation, for his business suffering. Yeah. But he told me he's undecided, but Trump might be the final factor because he said Trump picks winners. Andy, before I let you go, I got to ask you about Bob Casey Jr. Voting the way he's voting on, on abortion rights. You know, I, I, you've been covering politics slightly longer than I have, but the Casey name and pro-life Democrat, this was, you know, when I thought of the picture of pro-life Democrat in the political dictionary that you and I grew up with, Bob Casey Sr. Right. was on it. It's why Junior was recruited, why he won by so many points. 
How will that play here? How does his shift on abortion rights play here? And is what is the line? Are you going to get punished more for being for an outright ban or for being for fewer exemptions? I think it will be a factor with the abortion issue for sure. I remember, I can't remember what presidential uh, uh, co- uh, convention it was when Bob Casey was yeah. not allowed to come to into the I think room. It was 96, it's, right? Yeah. I, I believe 1996. Yeah. I've been around a little bit long as well, but I'm not sure who's been around longer, Chuck. We're close, I know. But will it play big time? I think so, too. I mean, as you saw, Casey uh, defeated Barletta several years ago. Casey is a juggernaut in Pennsylvania. He's a respected individual, well-liked. But I think on the abortion situation, the real conservative folks mm-hmm. are going to say, we respect, it, we respect him, we don't respect his decision on this abortion issue. I and think it could be a big factor. What was interesting to me today, and granted, it was a, this was an event that McCormick was having at a technical school. We're in the, in the, in the um, essentially the energy capital of the state, mm-hmm. this area right now, so it's understandable. But not a bit of any of that social conservative red meat, not a, a lick of it. Um, are you seeing the rhetoric on the trail heat up at all on abortion rights or no? <laughs> No, (laughs) no. And that's been the big surprise to me on the Democratic side. Yes. Right. But not on the Republican. But not on the Republican side. Even the voters I've been talking to have been repeating what you're hearing from Republican politicians talking about the leak, the issues with Mm -hmm. with the Supreme Court, not about the actual contents of of that leak. I'm not hearing that from voters. I'm certainly not hearing that from candidates. I get the sense Dr. Oz does not want to have a detailed conversation about abortion. I don't think so. If if I do hear about abortion, I hear about it from voters saying, wait a minute, that Oz guy is he really is yeah. is he really pro life yeah and you know and, and when you watch political ads we know what they are they, it, 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 we know what the beast is but there's not denying what you've said whether you you change right. your mind there's not denying what you said and I think a true conservative at least what I know in northeastern Pennsylvania and, and, and here in the Keystone State uh, that matters to them your word what how uh, such a big issue how do you change that quickly right or, it, it's a hard for some words. people to understand how you right. switch on an issue like that it's one thing on trade policy right it seems a little bit different it's to like people. one of these deals what's yeah. that not with abortion though and it's good to see you say so, hey great to get my the, pleasure get, and honor get, to get be the here. intel get the intel from you here uh thanks and for I having know, me uh dasha you've been doing terrific work so thank you both thank and you. to uh lisa sylvester out there at pxi really appreciate your help as well up next one of the reasons we picked luzerne county as a place to watch in 2022 is because it is representative of a sea change in American politics, where long-standing loyalties to the Democratic Party have shifted to the right. I'm gonna speak with two Pennsylvania officials who have had an up-close and personal experience with this changing electorate. They both join me here on set after this short break. You're watching a special edition of Meet the Press Daily, live from the Keystone State. As we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we're in beautiful Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the areas of the state that has grown increasingly Republican over the last few election cycles. Luzerne went for Trump in 2016 and again in 2020 after going for Democrats in the previous four presidential elections. County also voted for Senator Bob Casey's Republican challenger in the 2018 midterm. So we've been watching this shift uh, go on for most of the decade. So what does that shift continue to look like here in Luzerne and what can it tell us? about the larger sea change in American politics ahead of next week's primaries. I got a couple of guests here who've been dealing with this changing electorate. Two politicians who've had a front row seat to these changes. The current independent state senator and a former Democrat, John Udichek, and the mayor of Wilkes-Barre, George Brown. Uh, mayor Brown, Senator, good to see you both. Mayor, let me start with you. Sure. Um, look, this used to be a pretty strong Democratic area. Uh, a lot of union Democrats, culturally conservative, but economic populist. Um, we've watched this shift. Tell me, tell me about it in your own, through your own lens. Sure. Well, Wilkes-Barre still is a strong Democratic city. Mm-hmm. Uh, the majority of voters are Democratic in Wilkes-Barre. But when you talk about the county, it's more of a 50-50 split. And in the last elections we saw when uh, President Trump ran against Hillary, uh, he, he had a more of a commanding lead with the Democrats when he ran against Mr. Biden about 5,000 less Democrats than he had when he ran against uh, Hillary. So it really depends, I think, on the candidates Mm -hmm. that are running and whether you're a Democrat or Republican, that's how they decide which way to vote as far as the candidate. Do they feel a relationship with that candidate? Do they feel that the values that candidate's putting out is what they're looking for? So, but Wilkes-Barre still is a predominantly a Democratic city. Senator, you got elected as a Democrat. You decided to leave the party. You didn't go to the Republicans. You, you, you want to be independent. And these days, it's tough to be in the middle. You, I, I, trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of uh, left and right don't like that these days. 
Tell me in your own words why you did it. Well, I, I think the party that captures the middle, whether that's the middle class mm -hmm. or the middle of the road voter, is the one that can govern. We have the two bases of the respective parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. Their base, uh, it, it, they're bankrupt. Uh, it, it, they're driven more by outrage and hate mm -hmm. uh, against one another than they are about rallying around behind the city, the Commonwealth, or the country. Uh, that's why I moved from the Democratic Party. I, I grew up, my father was a United Mine Worker. My mom worked for Ask Me, a public sector union. Blue collar roots, very, very deep in my family for generations. When the Democratic Party, particularly at the national level, not only started to dismiss those blue collar voters, but to demonize them, that's when I decided I need to get to Where the Where do they demonize them? I mean, because policy-wise, you get, I've had progressives will argue, hey, who's actually advocating for, for better policy for these folks? And they say- I'll give you a great example. So, yeah, I'll give you ahead. a great example, Chuck. I was a big advocate for an energy project here in Luzerne County, a $6 billion project that's gonna be transformative for the region, $25 billion economic impact, and also right on the environment. But because it was tied to natural gas, 50% of the Senate Democratic Caucus voted against voted against legislation that would provide an incentive to this company. Not only did they vote against it, when we had a rally with union building trade workers, mm -hmm. union building trade workers fighting for their jobs, the rallying cry of the progressives and the far right was your jobs don't matter. And when you tell a man or a woman that their job don't ma that their job doesn't matter, you're telling them they don't matter. That's when I decided I need to get to the center to get away from the extremes on both the right and the left to try to rally the middle, middle class and the middle of the road voters to get back to common sense policies in this Commonwealth. Mayor Brown, how would you, uh, you tell me, how do you, s this is, the energy sector's been pretty important I, uh, to economic development around here. Obviously there, there's a, there's, concern about climate change and there's some concern about what would you say to national democratic leaders about both the importance of that and how do you pitch climate change proposals that don't scare people uh, around here? Well, let's be honest. There is a change in the climate. People can debate that. They can say yes and no. I firmly believe there is. We've held rallies in Wilkes-Barre on, on Public Square mm -hmm. uh, addressing the climate change. We have to take a realistic approach to this. There is a problem. We have to make sure that we address it. But at the national level, the, the leaders at the national level have to do this. Naturally, as a city, I'm going to follow whatever they, they put out. If I believe in my heart, it's the right way to go. But it is serious. It's real. And I also, I, I do implore our, our congressmen, our, our senators, our president to take this seriously and make sure that we take the proper stance here and the proper methods. How would you sell it? How would you how would you? Uh, a piece, Senator, uh, Senator Udicek uh, UD here. How would I? A piece, you know, the concern about the issue of, hey, these regulations are there, you know, that um, that the half the Democratic Party essentially doesn't want to use government uh, investment for the energy sector. What would you say to the national? Uh, well, I think that it's going to be necessary down the road. It's going to have to happen. Uh, Senator Udichak and I, we, we've agreed on several key issues over the last three years that I've been in office. And the senator has been a, a wonderful help as far as securing funds for us mm -hmm. for different projects we have going on during the city. So we, we are alike in several ways uh, as far as the major policies that we, we want to push through. You're exactly right. I mean, we, we have to get together in, in unison and, and work on this. We have to do something about the energy problem. Right now, 459 a gallon, yeah. that, that's not going to cut it. I keep seeing 650 for diesel. That is just scary exactly. when you see uh, that number there. I'm curious, Senator, when you move <clears throat> to, when you, when you got rid of the D and you put the I there, is it make it harder to legislate? Is it, you know, that that's the one, you know, that there's a, a huge desire. Voters say they want more independent candidates, yeah. but it's hard to let, it's hard to function. It's a great a question. Uh, as, as a student of politics as you are, yeah. uh, uh, the conventional wisdom would be yes, it makes it much harder yeah. from the middle and from the independent party. Uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, some of my biggest legislative achievements have been in the last three years because I was one, independent, two, in the Republican majority, and three, have many Democrat friends like Mayor Brown here in the city of Wilkes-Barre. We're able to cross the aisle. That is really what voters want to see. 
can you accomplish tangible things? Unfortunately, Pennsylvania has closed primaries. Independents like myself can't right. vote. So only the extremes uh, dominate the primary election. And I think that's what you see playing out when, in states that have closed primaries. If you had a more robust primary, an right. open primary, you would be able to have that debate. And legislators would not have to be looking to primary opponents. Rather, they'd be looking to appealing to general election voters. Give me the general election in a Senate race that would be the most difficult for you to decide upon. The, which Meaning, you, the, tell me the two candidates, if they face each other, that'll make your your decision In, in this Pennsylvania yeah. Pennsylvania primary, I, I, I think, and you mentioned it earlier, I think uh, Oz Fetterman be a tough would, would, would be a very tough uh, decision Why? for me. I, I think now someone on the Democratic side, like Connor Lamb, uh, who would represent this area very well, who just got the endorsement from the Philadelphia Inquirer, a rather progressive newspaper, they said he's a candidate that could add value versus a candidate like Fetterman who just adds a vote. Uh, I think both candidates, Oz and Fetterman, are more about celebrity than they are substance. Hmm. So that would be a very difficult challenge for voters in the Northeast between Oz and, and Fetterman. Mayor Brown, who would, uh, who would do best here? Uh, who you, I, I who feel do well it would come better. down to Connor Lamb, Congressman Lamb, and also uh, Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz has the, uh, the name, the publicity, mm -hmm. the, the money. Congressman Lamb has, he, he was in Congress, Mm -hmm. Marine Corps uh, experience. I think I, I like some of his values that he's put forth. So I would see that that as a uh, battle between Congressman Lamb and uh, Dr. Oz. Well, I appreciate getting, I have a feeling I got much better political handicapping from the two of you than from anybody we're, we're dealing with today. Good to talk to both of you. Good to meet you. Thank you very much. Uh, Welcome to Wilkesbury. What Chamber of Commerce weather you brought here? We got to give the mayor credit the for that. The mayor gets all the credit. Yeah. You know, we knew you were coming. This is, I mean, not when Lester a, was here. Two literally, years ago. not figuratively, literally <laughs> not a cloud in the sky. If you can find it. When Lester was here two years ago, Same we thing? couldn't do anything for him. It rained. It was terrible. Rain. All right, I'll let him know. Lester now knows, you know, who, who gets more love here. All right. <laughs> Mayor Brown, uh, John Udicek, thank you both. Up next, we're going to head to the other side of the state, back to Beaver County, another place that we put on our county to county spotlight, and another place where Republicans are making inroads to what used to be traditional Democratic leaning union workers. You're watching a special edition of Meet the Press Daily live here in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. <laughs>